people that are decision makers on the committee. Uh, during the course of my time in Olympia, it was apparent to me that a lot of us needed a little more training and a little more information on this subject. So it became apparent to me that I wanted, uh, wanted to invite the press here, and I'm, I'm really pleased that the press is here since they write about these issues, and I know they want to be completely accurate in their stories. Uh, I see legislative assistants here. They handle a lot of correspondence for their members. I think it's important that they understand. And I think those that uh, serve or lobby on or around the Pension Policy Committee being here is very, very valuable and can prove to be a benefit uh, to all of us. Uh, we're going to go through this. The staff has put it together about where the money comes from, uh, how the money comes out, that we're a little better uh, prepared. We're not going to have a test and ask anyone to know all of the acronyms. There will be extra credit and vacation time to the legislative assistants that do know all of those. <laughs> Uh, but I, I do, once again, appreciate all of you for being here. Uh, I think it's, it's a good opportunity, and I hope we can make the best of the next 55 minutes. Good morning, everyone. My name is Laura Harper, and I'm the Research and uh, Policy Services Manager for the Office of the State Actuary. That's a mouthful. And my co-presenter today is Lisa Wan, and she's an actuary with our office. We're going to start with this image that reminds us of the pension system in Washington State. When we think about pensions, um, this picture comes to mind, partly because we work across the street from it every day and we see it every day, but partly too because it represents something um, that we'll talk about today. If you look at the dome in this picture, we think of that as the benefit structure in Washington. And if you look beneath the dome, you see that there's a very strong structure that holds that dome up. And we think of those pillars that support the dome as the funding structure. So what we're here to talk to you about today is the funding structure. What are pensions? Well, you don't need to know a whole lot about that question for this class today. Um, basically, all you need to know is that we're talking about lifetime retirement benefits. And these are promises that are made today to pay for benefits that are in the future. Promises made today for benefits in the future. So how do you secure a promise for something that's going to happen in the future? And what are some of the challenges in securing that promise? We want to talk to you about those things today. So first we'll start with who pays for pensions. In Washington, both members of the retirement system and employers pay for pensions. Employers means governments. Members and employers put in money on a regular basis, and there's cost sharing between them. Now, those contributions from members and employers are then pooled, and they go into a trust fund where they're held and invested. That fund grows through investing. So we're actually making the fund work for the plan. Now here's just a snapshot of how the costs are covered through the pension trust fund. You can see that that large purple area in the pie chart is about three quarters of the pie. And that represents investment returns. So about 75% of the costs of the plan are covered by investment returns. Then you see the other two slices of the pie, those two green slices that take up about a quarter of the fund, those are basically member and employer contributions. That's a rough split of the cost, cost sharing that we talked about. So now Lisa's going to give you a little bit more detail about those pieces of the pie. Let's start with the member contributions. Member contributions come from payroll deductions. And a payroll deduction impacts a member's take-home pay. Those contributions are also done on a pre-tax basis, so there's some tax advantages. When you're contributing to a pension plan, you're doing that during your working life. Generally, that's when your income's higher and you're at a higher tax bracket, and those are made with pre-tax dollars. 
Then when you receive your pension benefits in retirement, generally that's when your income's lower and that's when your pension is taxed. So you have some tax advantages. The employer contributions are made at the time of member contributions. And it's taken out of government budgets. This impacts taxpayers. Employer contributions come from tax revenues, so the employer is the taxpayer. The third piece of the pie Laura talked about is investment returns. And that was that big 75% approximately. And the contributions from the member and the employer go into the trust fund and they're invested. And that investment is managed by the Washington State Investment Board. And the investment returns for Washington currently provide about 75% of plan costs. 75%, that's a really big number. How do we get to 75% of plan costs? Well, there's several things, but one of the things we want to talk about this morning is, is that term you've heard, time value of money. Time value of money, basically a dollar is worth more today than in the future. If we convert that statement to investing, if you invest a dollar today, it's worth more than investing a dollar in the future because your money has the potential to earn investment returns. Now when we talk about investment re returns, we also need to mention the other side of it, which is investment risk. I'm sure you're familiar with the term risk and return. Generally, the more risk you take in investments, the higher your return. So we can maximize the growth in our, in our trust fund by timing our contributions. And if, if you also remember hearing investment terms where you, know, you want to contribute regularly so you're not hitting the market at the wrong time. So the timing of our contributions can also help us maximize our investment returns. But basically one of the things we want to leave you with when we talk about time value of money is pay now or pay more later. So here's a simple example of that time value of money. We're looking at a one-time $10,000 investment and it's earning an 8% return annually. If you make that investment today, 2008, by 2038, it's a little over $100,000. If you waited 10 years to make that same $10,000 investment, by 2038, it's less than 47,000, so less than half. Okay, so that gives you an idea of pay now or pay more later to reach that goal. Okay, now we've talked a little bit about who pays, the member contributions, the employer contributions. We've talked about the investment piece of the pie. And so now we're going to step outside that process a little bit and pretend that we are designing a pension plan for the first time. And we want to figure out what funding approach do we want to use? How do we want to pay for this pension plan? Well, there are about three basic approaches that you would consider if you were designing a pension plan. And the first would be what we call pay as you go. The second would be a big upfront payment, lump sum, and then you're done. And then the third that we're going to talk about is something in between those two, which we call systematic actuarial funding. And that's kind of a mouthful, but really all it means is regular payments over time. So I'm going to go into a little more detail on those three approaches. The first approach is pay as you go, and in, under that approach, the contributions are made as the benefits are paid. So why is this the most expensive financing plan? Well, because it uses very little investment earnings. Of course, if you're not going to use investments to work for the plan, then you don't have risk associated with that. But basically, this approach is a minimal use of the time value of money. The second approach that we're looking at today is upfront payments. Now, overall, this would be the least expensive approach to funding your plan. Because if, if you remember Lisa's graph, if you took all the money and you put it in up front, then you can have that money work for you that whole time period before those benefits are due. 
And so it can grow and you can use not only your lump sum, but also those investment earnings to offset your obligations in the future. And that's the maximum use of the time value of money. And of course, because you're using investments to work for you, you also do have some investment risk. And then the third approach is something that we call systematic actuarial funding. Again, that just means regular payments over time. And as Lisa said, the investment returns are earned systematically over time. The money goes into the fund systematically over time. And the investment risk is also spread over time. This, the cost of this, in terms of funding your plan, is somewhere in between pay as you go and the lump sum approach. Now, Washington uses this approach. And in fact, most state plans do use some form of systematic actuarial funding. We do have one or two chairs left over here if some, some people want to sit down and make themselves comfortable. So, so many states use the systematic actuarial funding approach, and it's not surprising that they do because states are kind of uniquely situated to be able to do that. First of all, they're not likely to go out of business. They, la they have a long time frame. They also can collect regular payments from taxpayers over time. And their employees can also um, put in those regular payments as their paychecks are paid. Um, governments are also uniquely situated to um, get economies of scale in the market. And there's research that shows that larger plans tend to have a higher funded status. Um, Washington is lucky because we, ha we are a very large plan, so we can get great economies of scale. And in fact, um, last year, pension and investments rated Washington as number 20 in the country in terms of size. So that's public and private plans <coughs> together. So we do have a large plan, and so there's opportunity to be well-funded. So um, we've talked about several approaches to funding, and we've talked about how states tend to pick this systematic actuarial funding approach. And so now we're going to have the actuary tell you what that actually means, a little more of the details about how you pull that off. So we're going to dive a little more into systematic actuarial funding. And these are the things we want to touch on for the next few minutes. What Laura talked about earlier, regular payments over time. We also want to talk about something called fairness across generations and how systematic actuarial funding requires a long-term view. So Laura mentioned that systematic actuarial funding means looking out to the future. We're going to fund this plan over time, so we have to make assumptions about that future, future pension payments, future investment returns, and how do we do that? Some of the assumptions that we make include things like when will people retire? How much will salaries increase over the, over the next several years? And there's several other assumptions we have to make in a pension plan. And that allows us to calculate those future benefits. When you're making assumptions, there is risk. There's risk that your assumptions could be wrong. So we do something that allows us to manage and monitor those risks. And that's every year we do annual actuarial valuations. And every six years, we do experience studies. And these allow us to look at what actually has happened in the plan and compare that to what we expected to happen based on the assumptions we have set. This also gives us the opportunity at that time to recommend adjustments to our assumptions if they're out of line. We also have to apply professional judgment in setting assumptions and managing a pension plan. And actuaries are guided by, we have standards of practice. We have a code of professional conduct, and we have standards of practice that we have to follow. 
And we also apply something we term reasonable conservatism. Well, what does that mean? When you're setting assumptions, as I mentioned earlier, there's a risk that your assumptions are wrong. And your assumptions could be wrong in either direction. And sometimes, if they're wrong in one direction, you can have a really bad outcome. So in that case, we want to apply reasonable conservatism so that we can limit that bad outcome. So the regular payments we talked about for systematic actuarial funding come from this process that actuaries do of setting assumptions. And we calculate these contributions as a percent of pay. We have to consider future benefit payments, so we make assumptions and projections as to how much benefits will be in the future, when they'll be paid. We also consider the value of our assets in the trust fund. And we also have to look at future service payroll because we're making that contribution as a percent of pay. The second item on our our chart for systematic actuarial funding is something termed fairness across generations. Well, what does that mean and why is it important? Systematic actuarial funding looks to the future, we've talked about that. It spreads benefits over members' working lifetime. The challenge is to make that fair. Why is that important? This is a public plan. As we mentioned earlier, contrib employer contributions are taxpayer dollars. We need to ensure that there's fairness. If you look at that, that first bullet under assuring fairness, this is a long sentence, so we're going to work through it a couple times because it's really important. We need to fund the plan so costs of members' benefits are paid by the taxpayers who received services from those members and that's a term called intergenerational equity. And we're gonna take a, another minute and look at a slide to try and help you understand that, because it, it's, it's kind of a tough concept, especially when you're just reading it in words. So we're looking here at two different generations, Generation A and Generation B, and we've got them in pretty colors so you can identify them. Basically what we're saying with intergenerational equity or fairness across generations, Generation A begins working here and they retire out here. They are working and providing services to the public through that period of time. If we can apply fairness across the generations, then the funding for their benefits they're earning will also occur during that period of time. And when generation is ready to retire, their benefits have been funded. So that's our goal. So we've talked about intergenerational equity, or fairness across the generations. Laura mentioned three different funding approaches that can be used in managing a pension plan. Let's have a look at how they work together. In pay as you go, which you're making payments into the plan as benefits become due. That means the current generation is putting contributions into the plan to pay for the benefits of the retirees, which is a past generation. It's like Social Security. We don't have fairness across the generations. With the upfront payment method, that's when we have a great big lump sum of money go in, and it's going to pay for all future benefit payments. Well, that lump sum comes in with that current generation, but it's paying for all future generations. So again, we don't have fairness across the generations. With systematic actuarial funding, remember that's regular payments over time, we have the current generation paying for pensions earned by the current generation. We have fairness across the generations. The third item on our systematic, systematic actuarial funding is long-term view. Why is that important? Laura mentioned that 
governments don't generally go out of business. This is a long-term promise for these pensions. Assumptions that actuaries set are, we look 30 years into the future. These are long-term perspective. Actuaries also have to smooth out trends over time. A simple example here to help you understand that is the stock market. Everyone is familiar with the volatility of a stock market, ups and downs and ups and downs. If we weren't able to smooth those gains and losses that come from a stock market or our investment returns, then our contributions would also have that kind of up and down. So we are able to smooth trends out over time. So the question is, is there enough money to pay those future benefits? We have to set reasonably conservative assumptions and keep that long-term view to secure that promise. Okay, so in thinking about securing the promise, um, we're going to turn briefly to a topic that gets raised in the pension world and sometimes in news accounts, and that's the idea of unfunded liability. Will there be unfunded liability, and what does that mean? So we're going to look to um, first a situation where you're, you've got a plan and you're funding it for the future. We talked earlier about pretending like you're inventing a pension plan. Okay, so you've decided to pick systematic actuarial funding and you know that there's promises that you're going to pay in the future. There's benefits that have not yet been earned in the future. And so to the extent that those benefits um, have not yet been earned, we know there'll be liability for them and we're going to plan for them, but they're unpaid costs because those benefits have not yet been earned. We refer to that actually as unfunded liability and that's actually normal. Most funding cost methods have some kind of unfunded liability. So in that situation, yes, you can maintain the fairness across generations that Lisa just talked about. But in contrast, there's another term that we wanted to distinguish for you, and, and that is that this is not the same thing as the UAAL that you hear about, the unfunded accrued liability. The difference between an unfunded liability and an unfunded accrued liability is that the benefits have already been earned. So those unpaid costs are about benefits earned in the past. When you think about Lisa's diagram about Generation A and Generation B, the unfunded accrued liability is in that older generation of people where there are some unpaid costs, but the benefits have already been earned. And then Generation B is now carrying some cost from those unpaid but earned benefits. So we're talking about something that was accrued in the past. And that's a distinction because that means that we don't have intergenerational equity. We're carrying forward a cost from the past, and the people today have to pay for it. Okay, so again, we turn to um, our three points for systematic actuarial funding, regular payments over time, fairness across the generations, and this long-term view. Those are the hallmarks of systematic actuarial funding. How do you maintain that? That's, that's the real challenge. Um, we're going to turn to something in recent history in the state of Washington, a picture of a short-term swing in contributions that happened uh, right at the turn of the century, right around the early 2000s. Um, we're looking here at employer contributions only. Uh, we're looking at our two largest plans, which are the teacher's retirement system and the public employee's retirement system. And you can see here that after um, some fairly consistent rather high, higher contributions in the 90s that as we got down to 2000, 2001, 2, 3, and 4, you've got some really low contribution rates in that picture. So what happened then? 
Well, one thing that happened was that there was a huge stock market run-up in the late 90s. Um, the stock market was really cooking, and there were a lot of investment returns um, were just even better than anybody expected, and it, it just felt like good times. And so some people refer to that, that dip in the contribution rates as the happy valley, and I have to give Eric Sun from Senate Ways and Means credit for that. <laughs> he refers to it as the happy valley. And why was that a happy valley? Well, you know, in terms of members' paychecks, it was like having a pay raise. I mean, you had much less coming out of your paycheck for pensions during those years. And for governments, you had an opportunity to use dollars for other programs. So it was a pretty happy time. Um, and it's a time when the short-term view prevailed. Um, now we're on the other side of the Happy Valley, and that's where, that's, that's the where it gets a little more painful. Because you see the rates are going back up, and this affects members' take-home pay. So if they get a pay increase, they don't feel like they got a pay increase because they got to put in more for the pensions. And government budgets, um, they have to figure out now, what do we do about all these different programs and how do we make it all fit together? So it's a challenge. And again, while it's a short-term swing, it raises the question about fairness to generations. Some people in that, in that diagram of the or that chart of the Happy Valley. Some people had a period of time where they were able to pay a lot less into the system where other people were paying more. So it starts to raise a question, are we being fair or consistent through the generations? And then finally, we have a member in, of the audience who has who's asked a question about why did we do it that way. And I know, I think during the um, Q&A, we'll have an opportunity for some people to speak to that. I think there were a lot of different factors that, were, that came into that decision. Um, there's, there's always situations where people might want to have a short-term view for some reason. Um, obviously, that was one, a, a situation where people did decide to have a short-term view. But the point that I think you're, you might be getting at is that, because um, you mentioned using that money, um, there is a lost opportunity to invest those contributions. And so the time value of money for those contributions could not be working for the fund on an ongoing basis. How many people were here when that happened? We have people that were here. Okay, so I, we have a number of people that could address the whys. And I'm reluctant to speak to that because it's a pretty complicated issue, but I think there's some, plenty of time at the end in Q&A to discuss that in more detail. So I hope we can save that question. Now, it, it raises a question when you talk about short-term swings and securing the benefits and are we being fair and are we losing opportunities? It raises a question possibly in people's minds. Well, are the benefits secure when we have these challenges? Are we still keeping the benefits secure? So we're going to ask Lisa, Lisa to just talk for a minute about how Washington plans are doing today. I guess I only have a minute. <laughs> we're going to look at Washington plans and how they're funded today. And Washington compares very favorably with other public and private sectors across the country. The combined funded status is 100%. What does that mean? If we look at all of our pension plans, it means that for every dollar of benefit that is accrued with those plans, we have a dollar of assets in the trust fund to pay for them. Okay, so we're 100% funded. This next graph gives you an example of each of the plans and their funded status. So you can see that it's, all the plans generally are very healthy, except two of our plans that Laura talked about earlier that have that UAAL, that unfunded accrued liability, and that's with PERS-1 and TERS-1. So some of those benefits that have been accrued in the past have, are not covered by assets in PERS-1 and TERS-1. Why did this happen? Some of the causes for 
them being in that situation right now is that there were benefit increases for past service. We call that retroactive. An example of that, Plans 1, when they were first introduced, didn't have cost of living adjustments, or we call those COLAs. When that was introduced, it was also given to people who were already in retirement. So it covered past service. Okay, so that's a retroactive benefit increase. Another cause of the unfunded accrued liability for PERS 1 and TERS 1 is underfunding. So there were times when contributions that were required to the plan weren't enough, that not enough contributions were made to the plan. The good news is there's an action plan in place to fully fund those plans by 2024, and that action plan is a requirement in statute. So the lessons learned from Plans 1 the benefits were not sustainable. Funding was not enough. So we talked about retroactive benefit increases, not making enough contributions. And those plans closed to new members. Sometimes what happens when plans close is new plans are introduced that the benefits are less expensive. Other methods that are are um, helping us secure the benefits. The funding method for plans two, three is the aggregate funding method. The aggregate funding method doesn't allow for an unfunded accrued liability. We also have minimum contribution rates in place starting in the next biennium. So regular payments or those contributions cannot fall below set amounts. Another thing that's provided in statute. We also have asset smoothing, and our asset smoothing rules have evolved over time, and that allows us to smooth out any volatility in our investment returns. Okay, so we've covered a lot of ground so far. We've talked about that pensions are lifetime payments, that there are obligations for the future that we're making promises today for payments that we will make tomorrow and that those benefits need to be secure. We've talked about that in Washington there are several funding approaches but we've chosen the approach of systematic actuarial funding. We've talked about that that includes regular payments over time. We've talked about um, the concept of fairness across generations and figuring out what those payments are. And then we've talked about the long-term view. So now we're going to look just for a moment um, to some of the challenges that we face in actuarial, uh, actuarial funding. And we've started to allude to some of those challenges already. When you looked at the Happy Valley and the pain of going back up, that's one of the challenges. When you looked at the, um, that crumbling column from the Plans 1 where Gosh, some new costs were introduced late in the game, and then um, some, some funding requirements were not met, and we actually had a situa situation where the plans had to close and we had to start over again. Kind of reminds me a little bit of what, about what's going on in the uh, housing market and the mortgage market today. Is you know, if you think of the pension plan as a structure or a home, there's going to be times when you're going to need to do a little more than what you're paying as your mortgage every month. You're maybe going to need to put on a new roof. You're going to need to maintain your structure. Um, sometimes you're going to want to remodel, and um, sometimes that's appropriate. But it also might require you to refinance. So it's, it's always a balancing act because you've got to pick something that you can afford. And this is the real challenge of decision makers, how to balance the views, how to balance systematic actuarial funding and decide when can we make a change to the system? When should we make a change to the system? So some of the questions that uh, policymakers are faced with are some of these on the, on the screen that you see. What happens when in the middle of a generation there's a request to change the plan? Or what happens when a plan is already closed but there's a need to do something about what happened in that plan. 
What happens when the investment results are different than what we expected? Do we need to change our assumptions? Do we need to look at things differently? What happens when contributions are delayed? There might be some good reasons for delaying contributions, but then are we losing some opportunity? And what's the balance between short-term flexibility, which is sometimes needed, and then the long-term security, which is also needed? And then another question, what happens when payment for current costs are pushed into the future? Can we maintain the fairness across generations of taxpayers so that the pension plan is sustainable? How do you meet those kinds of, stand of challenges? Just like you would if you were a homeowner, you've got to exercise judgment. And um, some of the qualities that, we, that come to mind are discipline, because that relates to the regular payments, balance, and then you need to decide carefully about when you change the rules or when you refinance. Fairness, um, what's going to be fair to all the different people who are affected by the change? And then finally, an eye towards sustainability, because we all know that whatever can't be sustained will end. Are the benefits in Washington secure? Um, Lisa just went over the funded status. 100% combined funded status is very good, but the future is still unknown. So when a change is proposed, the question comes to mind, what is the impact on the long-term security of the promise? So we're going to leave you with three questions in evaluating changes to our system. Are we systematically contributing the dollars that are needed to make investments work for us? Will the change allow us to keep fairness across the generations? And finally, will the pension plan be sustainable over time? So we end where we began with this beautiful image of the structure, the benefits being the dome, and those pillars underneath, which is the funding structure, which is designed to keep the benefits sound and safe and secure. And so now we're going to open the floor to some Q&A. This session is um, being taped by TVW, so if you, your question is going to be heard, we're going to need to have you speak into a mic. We have Darren Painter, who's going to pass the mic around as you think of your questions. And we're also going, to, also going to ask the state actuary to come up. He's Matt Smith. This is Matt. And also Dave Nelson. He's our senior policy analyst. And he'll be on our team for answering questions. And we're ready to open the floor. Okay, we'll start with uh, the first question that was raised during the uh, session. And do you want to repeat that for the, for the group? Uh, we were talking about the dip in um, the um, investments by the retirement system, oh, by the employers and the employees, because the stock market had, uh, the returns had risen, so they gave uh, less in contributions. I'll give you the real short answer, and it kind of fits into the theme of this presentation. Um, there was not a long-term view in place at that point in time. And the other important thing to remember is that the actuarial methods in place at that time were also supporting more of a short-term perspective. Asset returns were, were recognized much more quickly. So that smoothing that Lisa mentioned, smoothing was much shorter. Um, we hadn't really seen as dramatic of stock market inclines like that in the past. So the systematic actuarial funding was producing short-term contribution swings at that point in time. And also there was some early adoption of contribution rate decline. So it really was just a, a combination of a lot of short-term view, actuarial methods, as well as some of the decisions that were made were short-term and perspective. And uh, I, I think the happy valley could also be called the painful valley as well, because I think there's two sides to it. Matt, I just I want to ask that question again because you know that the the statutes required those those rates to go down because we didn't have a minimum floor 
establish for rates. And that one of the great accomplishments of the uh, new Select Committee on Pension Policy was to put in a rate floor so that we wouldn't see the law, the, 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 as you know, the statutes required those rates to go down because we were experiencing such huge investment gains and that we actually needed to put a floor in there so that we prevent this from happening again. Your other analysis is correct, but I think that was important too. Over here, we have a question. I'm Bruce Reeves. I um, understand in the presentation you made a great deal of effort to uh, come out with the fairness quote idea. And a lot of us are, have some doubts about the fairness that the state has uh, as they have approached a lot of the funding for, for the pensions. I'm speaking particularly of the PERS-1 and TRS-1, that the state hasn't uh, always kept up with their contributions. And in our view, uh, that kind of lowered the amount of money invested which would be a gain for not only the state, but, but the, uh, the employees that are retired. And the state has, over the years, moved the target a little bit. But I'm just bringing up the point that uh, this fairness issue is not what is really brought out here, really to be the actual effort by the state, it seems, to a lot of us. Other questions? We're in, the middle, in the middle of the room. My name is Wendy Weeks. I have a question with regards to uh, the impact of the boomer blip. Um, Right now, we're seeing the the first uh, edge of that population entering uh, retiree status, and uh, as the midpoint of that moves into retiree status, how is that going to affect the form uh, the funding formula? Great question. It is something that we're anticipating. So when Lisa talked about performing actuarial evaluations, we literally have uh, data for every individual member in the retirement system, every active member, every retired member. We know when they're going to be eligible to retire. We make assumptions for when they're going to retire. So, you know, we are modeling the, the blip or the boom as, you're, as you refer to it. Um, but what's interesting is we're also in the middle of an experience study right now that we'll be releasing um, later this year. We're also seeing that people are working longer. Um, so it's an interesting uh, phenomenon. The, the, boom, the baby boom is coming, we're planning for it, but we're also finding that they're not retiring as early as we thought they might. So, some good news. At least from the funding perspective. <laughs> good morning, thank you for the presentation. Would you be able to address the new federal legislation, the Federal uh, Pension Protection Act, uh, as to how the impact is uh, on pension funds being used for medical expenses? Um, I probably would not be able to address that today. <laughs> I'm not sure that, um, that we did talk about the Pension Protection Act in an earlier session last year with the Select Committee. And so we have some materials on our website that um, have already been prepared, which I could send to you. Um, mostly the, the Pension Protection Act focused um, more on private sector plans in terms of funding rules. Um, we find that public sector plans are subject to less federal regulation than private sector plans. Um, part of the reason for that is because um, governments have more, um, more things in place to allow for checks and balances. They have governance structures, they have have statutes, they have constitutional protections for pension rights, that kind of thing. So there's less regulation coming out of the Pension Protection Act. There were some opportunities for public sector plans that came out of that act. 
Yeah, we'll have you speak into the mic so everybody can hear. Yeah, I, I believe my understanding was that uh, in a defined benefit program, public or private, that uh, if the value uh, of the fund exceeded 120% of the liability, the additional funds could be used to uh, offset the cost of medical expenses. Um, that's, there's roughly something like that, but... There are some federal provisions that allow for what's deemed maybe an overfunded pension plan, and I think that's kind of a risky proposition to begin with because it's, you need to be careful how you define an overfunded pension plan um, can be used um, to fund some retiree medical benefits. But I think the primary objective is to fund the pension plan first and to make sure you're measuring a fully funded plan using a very conservative set of assumptions. You're, you're essentially closing down the plan. So you wouldn't be using the assumptions that we're using for an ongoing plan. But there are some provisions in federal law. Matt, as I listen to the analysis, one thing that I I've, uh, did not see in this analysis was the fact that our, our pension system uh, depends so fundamentally on investment income that 70 percent of the value of our pensions are driven by investment. Uh, doesn't that mean that when we try for intergenerational equity, and even though that's a great principle to strive for, that so much hinges on the investment markets and the rate of return on the uh, pension money that it makes it difficult. That, that very dip you talk about here, this Happy Valley, is caused by, was caused by an enormous uh, bull market in that period of time, and not every generation has that bull market. That's correct. I mean, earlier in the presentation, we talked about the funding sources that investment return makes up about three quarters of, of funding. You're, you're correct. Um, and I think I like the way you described intergenerational equity, and it, and it relates to the earlier comment. I mean, it is a principle, it is a goal, and it's a cornerstone of actual funding. That, that doesn't mean you automatically get intergenerational equity. It's something you strive for. Um, it's something that policymakers can consider when they're adopting contribution rates. And we have put methods in place that will make it easier to maintain that intergenerational equity by the minimum contribution rates that you mentioned, Representative Conway, and by using appropriate asset smoothing. So if there is bull markets like that again, and we could also see something on the other side, you know, a real down market, that one generation isn't overly burdened with either the gain or the loss. And that's that spreading of risk that Laura mentioned. Um, how much of that can be spread into the future is another issue of fairness. So it, it, is a, it is a discipline, it is a goal. Um, it is not an automatic that you get intergenerational equity. But I would argue I think it's a fundamental principle um, that you'll see in pension funding and worthy, a worthy effort. I think we might have time for about one more question. Thank you. Uh, I thought that was an excellent presentation. I, I really am hoping that uh, our people also could get a, a little bit more of a feel as to the type of pensions we have. Uh, as you know, we have defined benefit, we have defined contribution, and we have hybrids. And the effect that those have on the contributions. And I think we talk about the the valley of death or whatever you want to call it. But the valley of death uh, happened way back in the 70s also. Uh, as you know, Plan 1 people continued to put in their 6% every year, every month, every day, and the state did not. Now, in other plans that we have, if the, if the state reduces their contribution, most of the other plans can get their, the employee can get their contribution reduced also. So the defined benefit of Plan 1 occurred when the state did not live up to their word, uh, even though the defined benefit, in my opinion, and in AARP's opinion, and in many opinion, is the very best pension that we can have is defined benefit for the employee and the employer. I guess you can see from that, those comments that there's a lot to pensions that we didn't cover. This is a, something that is new for our office. The outreach that we've done today is an experiment.
Um, we decided to start with funding because that's what we're most familiar with. But there's opportunities to talk more about things like health care, things like plan design, debates about which kinds of plans work and how they should work. So we ask if um, you could, we'd love for you to um, pick up an evaluation, tell us if this, if this is useful to you, tell us if you have um, things that you'd like to see us speak to in the future. We thank you for coming. Um, we hope we'll have other opportunities to uh, answer questions. And we also want to let you know that there's websites where you can get more information. Select Committee on Pension Policy website, Office of the State Actuary, and of course the Department of Retirement Systems has a great website where you can learn about all about the different benefits and what happens in each of the plans. So we're going to adjourn now. We've got a Select Committee on Pension Policy meeting right down the hall and we're going to be talking about experience study results and that boomer blip. We're going to be talking a little bit about that. So we welcome you.